Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar with Absent. Uh, this is the Tuesday evening series, and tonight is the 12th uh, in this series. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Um, I have two guests tonight. I've got uh, Dr. Jordan Constantinides, who is a specialist in, he's from Greece, obviously, and he is a specialist in TBI, traumatic brain injury, and smell loss. And he's going to talk to us tonight. Uh, together with a patient, Kim Price, who is sort of a near neighbor of mine. Kim, I think we could say that. Um, and uh, Kim had a head injury. So I think um, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, um, before we get started with our conversation, what I'd like to do is show you a clip of a video that was made about Kim's injury. And this is a fascinating, um, a fascinating video. So if you just stay tuned while I um, queue up uh, YouTube, I will share my screen. And here we go. Oops, that's my spreadsheet. Stop share. We don't want that. Uh, let's try that again. Right, here we go. Okay, so can you all see that? Yeah, um, here we go and real insight into just how much damage a bang to the head can do critical care doctor friend of the program paul reese is here to talk to us about a recent call out it was really serious this one wasn't it yeah it's a very serious head injury this one okay so what had happened was a woman had fallen from a ladder banging her head on a concrete floor and this is what happened when paul got to her house hello there hello the doctor Hiya. who's this then just outside here, or yeah, okay. Are you knocked out at all? Really? Okay. If you go back in, take this down, please. Can you? Second. Can you can you go dusty, please, darling, please? Can you go right, please, darling? Okay. Please, can you get out of the way, please? Okay. And she fell out here in the car. Okay. About how long ago? About twenty-five minutes. Twenty-five minutes. Okay. And what was she straight away? Can you go right the way, please? Yeah. A bit dazed, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sat up. She wasn't knocked down, there wasn't no, that much. No, that's not much and since then, has become a bit more agitated, or yeah, keeps wanting to get up. Yeah, okay. Hi. How are you feeling there? Can I have a little look at your head? She's got a wound on her head. Okay. Get this. Oh, Stanley, sorry, can you go out the way, please, darling? Please, 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 go out the way, please, please. Please. Like we need to go to the hospital. We're going to have a little scan. Please, darling, go somewhere else. Please, Is that please. very sore? Please, please, please go and sit with. Oh. Can please, we just darling. take your jacket off? Please. That'd be all right. Please. And then, uh, Brian, what we'll need to do is get some IV access and uh, give us something to make her feel nice and relaxed. Please okay. go somewhere else. Please. Hold on. Please leave us alone, please. Please leave us alone. This is all just caused by a little bang on my head, so I wouldn't be too please. distressed by it. So I'm just going to draw up some medication make her feel a bit less agitated. Please, can you leave it? So this is not uncommon, okay? Please. Let's get these sorted for me. Please, please. Well done. Next in the moment. Please, please, can you do it, please? That's great. So I think what we plan to do is actually the lounge is quite warm, isn't it? And there's actually three solid access in there as well. So we'll lower a sign there, I think. Please leave it, please, please. It's actually quite distressing watching that because I don't know Kim, but she's clearly distressed, isn't she? How how did you how soon did you realise this was serious? Yeah, I think the job is to work out whether it's important or not when you walk through the door. And the way mm. she was acting suggests it was was a very serious head injury. Um, and why would she be talking like that then? Well, her brain is essentially starting to malfunction now. So some swelling in the brain or some bleeding is starting to cause pressure in the brain, and that's what's making her behave abnormally. And you realised pretty quickly that you were going to have to act soon, did you? Yeah, it's very clear looking at her that we're going to need to give her an anaesthetic and take her off to a specialist unit where she could have a CT scan and possibly an operation to fix that. So we knew that very early on. Okay, so Nigel, um, her husband, hi there. Um, you are very calm. Okay, everyone, I'm just going to advance the video a bit to show you the last section. <clears throat> this is just much easier for her. So we'll go to Southampton General, yeah. She'll be all right. She'll be all right. Well, Paul said she'll be all right. She is all right. Thank goodness. It's lovely <laughs> to see you, Kim. Um, yes, and how, how are you doing now, first of all? Yes, not bad. Really, really much this is better. It was about nine weeks ago this happened. Yes. Um, tell us, looking through that tape, 
you were talking in an extraordinary way. Do you remember any of it at all? No, I remember being up the ladder and holding the glass window to Nigel, but after that, I don't remember when the accident the, at all. When was the next time you do remember? Um, waking in hospital. And I didn't know why I was in hospital. <laughs> it all became clear a little bit later, yes. did it? Yes. Um, and how is it affecting you now? Um, I'm just, I do find I get a little tired in the day and um, a little bit lightheaded at times. Mm -hmm. um, my walking is much better because to start with, it was very difficult to walk. Why are you just, were you kind of having to learn to walk again? Yes, or? it's uh, somehow the injury affects um, muscle memory. And so you just have to build your confidence to be able to walk again. Okay, and you'd obviously injured your head. What exactly had you done? Um, I believe I had um, a subdural hemorrhage right. and contusions. Those are the technical terms. Um, but um, And an open head wound. Gosh. Um, and all is that, that's all serious stuff, isn't it, Paul? It is, it is potentially serious stuff, yes. Yeah. So some bleeding within the brain and some bruising, and you know, potentially that could have needed an operation to fix it, hence the importance of taking it directly to a hospital where they could have a facility to do that. And just tell us about um, that general aesthetic, because you sort of put her into what a chemically induced coma, did you? Yeah, if you like, we're switching off the brain's demand for oxygen. The brain is struggling for oxygen, so we turn that off by giving an anaesthetic. We can control her blood pressure, control her oxygen levels, and then safely get her to the hospital. Normally this would be done in a hospital, um, and you had not so many people, but Nigel, you were helping out, weren't you? I was as there, well? yes. <laughs> what were you doing? Holding the drip, I think, as, as far as I can remember. Yeah. And that, that presumably is helping him, is it, at the time to be well, I mean, he, you know, he, he was he was very helpful, uh, very calm, and able to help us with, with giving the anaesthetic by, uh, by acting as a drip stand. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, very useful in the day. <laughs> is he a bit of a hero for you? You always Yes. Was. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now, um, tell us about... Um, you're also um, having problems, aren't you, with your sense of smell and taste. So how is that affecting you? Um, well, it's something that um, initially I wasn't aware of because of or the injury. And um, mm. when I came home from hospital, <clears throat> um, I realised. And um, it's it's something that I'm getting used to. Mm. So. Um, it, I, I guess you sort of take, you all take it for granted being able to smell, don't we? So what sort of things are you missing? Um, just smelling clean laundry, my my girls, <laughs> my husband. Yeah. Just, just um, it's just a bizarre sense not to, to have. And just quickly, um, we were talking a little bit earlier, and you said that you knew it wasn't normal because you weren't swearing on the tape. Yes. Is that fair enough? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I wasn't. <laughs> yes, I think that's probably fair enough. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you're better. Thank, thank you. you all. Right. So, um, Kim, thank you for letting us share that. That's just an amazing tape. I think, you know, we talk, we, we talk a lot about TBI, uh, smell loss, but when you see something like that, it really brings it home to you what that means, uh, what that means in terms of the actual injury, and also seeing you so fresh after the, uh, the, the accident, you know, listening to you talk about your sense of smell, that, that, that really gets me going. So um, anyway, you, I thought that was very moving. Um, so I think Jordan, this would be a good time for you to uh, talk a little bit about what you do um, and, and you know, what's it like for you to see a tape like this? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you personally, Chris, and of course all of the Aspen community for their fantastic work uh, with Anosmics and uh, for uh, your kind invitation to participate in this webinar. So I'm running the Smell and Taste Clinic in Thessaloniki since uh, 2007. So for 13 years, we had a lot of experience with people uh, with traumatic brain injury and smell loss. And I will share with this experience within the next minute, uh, minutes uh, in order to have a discussion uh, then after my presentation. So uh, let's share. Uh, Oh, are you able to share your screen? Yes. Okay. No. Uh, hang on a second. Let's see if Maybe I can make some magic happen. Uh, there you go. You should be able to do that now. There we go. 
Okay. So, uh, talking from uh, the place of a smell and taste center, the percentage of people coming to us with a traumatic brain injury and smell loss is quite low. Uh, so, I think this has two main uh, uh, reasons. First, people with mild injuries usually do not realize that they have an olfactory dysfunction. So it's not something significant. They underestimate the situation. So they are not coming to us uh, early. So the second category of people is that these people with severe injuries. So they have many problems to deal with. So it, it is a reality that olfaction is not a priority for them. So I think about people in ICUs, multiple fractures, really significant things. Uh, uh, dealing with a very life really and but the problem is that olfaction is not a priority even for their doctors of course it's, it's uh, reasonable at uh, an initial uh, stage but uh, then i think that uh, this situation is underestimated actually what means for their quality of life in the long term so if uh, we see patients coming in a smell and taste center these three categories are uh, people uh, uh, who are coming to us with post-infectious olfactory loss, with cyanide metal disease, and post-traumatic. The main uh, uh, difference in post-traumatic cases is that it's a not homogeneous group of patients. So in the same group, you can find somebody with a mild injury, just a simple contusion, or somebody with multiple fractures uh, staying in an ICU for a long term. So it's not the same situation. However, if you see all the scientific papers are dealing with this group of patients as a homogeneous group, and maybe this is a problem when we canceling, we're canceling these patients. So we have to individualize our approach. So this is a problem that doctors have to solve and give really individualized uh, advices to these patients. So what are the causes? Sport injuries, assaults, falls, and car accidents. Of course, you can understand that falls and car accidents are, uh, can be found in all ages and in both sexes. As a Greek, I can say that we are one of the champions in car accidents. <clears throat> so one in three motor vehicle accidents involve the head and neck region. This is a really important information because, as I said before, we have to look for these situations. Sometimes people have, are not aware of it. So we have to ask in the history us actually we have to to uh, pass this information to the doctors how to find these people so uh, it's not uh, uh, our golden to, uh, tonight to talk about pathophysiology but i'm presenting this uh, slide just to show that it's not a one mechanism so there are multiple mechanisms and sometimes we can do some other things except of uh, just uh, medical consultation or some advice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it is straightforward that if we have uh, uh, a trauma in the nose, which is uh, decreases the airway, so maybe we can do something surgical. Right. So we have to look for this uh, uh, patient. So this is just an example of a lady who uh, had a car accident, 35 years old, you can see uh, the septal deviation caused by the accident. This lady had one sinusitis on one side because of this fracture. And of course, she had cacosmia. So after surgery, she became hypocosmic. Of course, not a perfect result, but for her, it was really significant. And not only that, actually, she was really happy because she had no cacosmia, because this cacosmia. Uh, was coming from the purely induced heart uh, due to sinusitis. Ah, okay. Mm. So, although these cases are rare, they exist. So, we have to look. In, in, in real life, uh, it's not only black and white. So, in some uh, uh, people, maybe there is some underlying condition diminishing or function somehow, but it's not realized. And then a traumatic brain injury can reveal all these problems. So it's a combination of things. So we have to look for it. But in, unfortunately, in, uh, in most of the cases, uh, what happens is um, uh, 
uh, uh, trauma of the olfactory bulb and olfactory filament at this level between the brain and the nose. And of course, uh, uh, temporal type lesions. And uh, I'll give you some information about this. It's not, sometimes we see uh, uh, really uh, big lesions in the brain, but only these categories, these uh, this, uh, areas of interest are significant for olfactory, mainly olfactory bulbs, orbital frontal cortex, frontal lobe, and temporal lobe. And now we have some uh, kind of uh, guidelines how to score an MRI and give you a prognosis having an MRI in our hands. So, Talking about prognostic factors, I would say that the severity of trauma is the most significant thing. The duration of olfactory loss, of course, the sooner somebody's coming, the better, and the age. So it is obvious that people with severe traumatic brain injury have much higher possibility to have a, a bigger olfactory loss. And some uh, uh, special skeletal fractures like this, which are crossing the area of our interest, are uh, related with olfactory dysfunction. And uh, this uh, study uh, says actually this, that people with a mild traumatic brain injury had 18% uh, olfactory dysfunction, but people with a uh, major thing had all 60% of people had olfactory dysfunction. Another, another significant thing is that 70% of skull-based fracture involve the anterior skull base. And here is the olfactory nerve which is crossing the cranial base. So that's why I'm trying to convince people in ICUs, neurologists, uh, neurosurgeons, that we have to look for these patients with severe traumas and ask, find quite early if there is a problem with olfaction. Here's some examples. Uh, you see on the MRI a bilateral lesion in the orbital frontal uh, complex. What about clinical uh, features? It is usually acute, more uh, severe than other uh, causes, and uh, they're related uh, quite often with qualitative disorders, meaning that parosmia, phandosmia are present. Parosmia means that I can smell something distorted. I have in front of me a coffee, but it doesn't smell like a coffee. Usually it's something bad, like uh, burning uh, thing or uh, whatever. So what we do is, of course, to uh, have an endoscopy of the nose, to have a look in the nose and see if we can fix something surgically. And of course, to measure the olfaction with psychophysics. This is the testing uh, which I'm using and uh, most of the centers in Europe are using different kit tests. But apart from that, now, as I said before, we can score an MRI and give you a, a, a prognosis about your situation with an accurate, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, high accuracy. We can predict anosmia and psychosis. And of course, we can measure also the olfactory bulb. It's a structure uh, between the brain and the nose. And according to uh, its size, we can say, yes, this uh, patient can have good prognosis or not. What about recovery? If we do nothing, uh, we have to expect that one in three within the next years will have some partial recovery. But complete recovery, unfortunately, only 10 to 15%. Of course, the significant factor is the remain factor. That's why it is significant to measure uh, uh, the olfactory function with this psychophysic test. And uh, we cannot rely only in subjective ratings. Unfortunately, in olfaction, uh, there is a mismatch between subjective ratings. If we ask them to rate the olfactory function and what if we measure with uh, the special test. Mm -hmm. And uh, this recovery most likely uh, can be occurred within the first two years. But this, uh, this information should be used really carefully. Because when we uh, speak about uh, statistics, we have to remember what I said in, uh, in the first slide. Statistics are coming from a group of, from an inhomogeneous group. So this maybe can disappoint the people 
if you, if you say that, okay, you, you know, you have a chance of only 10 to 50% to have a complete recovery, but maybe this is the case of a complete recovery in front of you. You don't know it. So, of course, statistically, the recovery usually are coming, is coming within the first two years, but I have some examples to show you that always there is a hope for recovery, even if you're coming late. So this is uh, exactly what we said before about the two years, and we use this information, especially in car accidents, uh, where a medical legal problem occurs, and uh, some people need some medical consultation about it. But although we say that, okay, after two years, the chances for, the, uh, for recovery are quite low, it is not zero. So what can we do? Of course, we can uh, uh, give uh, medications uh, or to operate people with post-traumatic sinusitis. We give some special instructions how to live in their homes. Uh, if somebody comes quite early to us, we can give steroids. There is a big discussion about steroids for how long, uh, if, if, uh, if uh, it really works and when. I would say that if a patient with a, a traumatic brain injury comes to my clinic quite early, meaning that within the first month after the trauma, uh, after uh, the trauma, Yes, I would give uh, steroids. But the question is, if somebody comes three months, six months later, is it any chance? There is no clear uh, answer uh, on this. But as we don't have evidence to say yes or no, I would say why not to try with a short uh, course, two to three days, see if there is some response and then follow a course of 15 days, the usual course we give. Because uh, in some cases, as I, as I, as I uh, said before, there are some uh, concomitant disorders. For example, sinusitis, inflammatory rhinitis. So we can have some gain from the other situation. Why not? So, uh, it is uh, welcome this, this olfactory gain. Last but not least, the olfactory train. So uh, um, people in, uh, involved in olfaction uh, know that the Professor Kuhlman started this uh, olfactory training uh, some years ago, proposing that this uh, uh, exposure to odors can help olfaction to recover. It seems like acceleration of the uh, normal uh, Progress of uh, the system of uh, olfactory loss, but uh, in the beginning we had all, uh, only evidence about post infectious loss. Now we know that it works in, in uh, traumatic brain injury. This is a study from uh, my uh, uh, center where we showed that if you do nothing, you have a chance for recovery of 15%. But if you do olfactory training, this percentage goes to one in three, more or less. Percent. Okay, it's not perfect, but it's it's uh, much better than the control group. To improve, usually uh, we have improvement with younger people, people with less duration of the disease, and less severe trauma, um, meaning that of course an ICD stay. You can understand that. Uh, this is something more severe uh, from uh, injury and less imaging findings, meaning that uh, bilaterality is something uh, significant and uh, decreases the chances of for recovery. And again, um, another study showing that olfactory training works in post traumatic loss, giving some information that is a top down uh, process. In the beginning, we uh, believe that olfactory training is a reorganization of, of the brain, how we can smell better, but now we have evidence that this situation also, uh, this uh, kind of treatment helps also the olfactory healing. 
the node itself to, to recover. So, is, is there any other medical treatment? Mm, it, it's hard to say. There are some studies uh, uh, proposing zinc, but this is not clear. And uh, we have some evidence of intranasal vitamin A in drops. It is quite clear that somehow it works in post infectious disorders. Not really clear in post traumatic, but I would say also why not? Because it is something um, additional. It's not the main thing. The main thing for me is on partially training, but in combination, maybe because it works at the level of, of the olfactory system, why not to improve locally the situation, to uh, calm down the inflammation in, in the area of the olfactory system? I would say, uh, why not in, in the uh, traumatic brain injury uh, phase? So the other thing, that we have to deal with a, a long lasting quantitative uh, disorders like parosmia and thrombosis. Difficult, uh, difficult uh, to, to treat. Sometimes we use a uh, sequential uh, anesthetization with dilocane of the olfactory cleft to diagnose the situation and maybe to help to give some free intervals uh, from the symptoms. We give hypertonic saline drops. Some people prescribe gabapentin, which is an inotropic. Uh, medication and uh, really not often some people uh, propose surgery. I don't have uh, the experience of surgery besides the whole olfactory system. I feel that this is quite risky yeah. and uh, I would propose that uh, a, a watchful uh, uh, wait and see policy may be better because most of the people with these disturbances are getting better uh, within the next year. It resolves, yeah. yeah. So uh, usually we prepare the node with some decompression uh, and then we apply uh, again and see how it works. So when we cancel patients, we definitely have to uh, uh, prepare them to have a gas and smoke detector at their home just to avoid uh, an accident. One in six patients have some accident, actually, at their home, uh, for getting something in the oven or something things like that. Uh, of course, labeling of foods is really significant to avoid uh, uh, problems like the different varieties, for example, attention to personal hygiene. And of course, the diet. For me, it's really significant and also for the patient. I'll give you some details about this later on. And last but not least, the psychological aid. I think it goes together with uh, the diet uh, problems. Yeah. One is triggering the other. So it's not something uh, uh, not related with the other things, but we have to see in a multiple uh, ways all these uh, psychological problems. Uh, which are related with the diet and the everyday uh, quality of life and uh, the activity uh, limitations caused by the traumatic brain injury. Because when people are aware of these problems, this is triggering a list of activity limitations and you see that personal safety work, what they feel about uh, food preparation, their diet, so this is triggering also emotional responses and it goes back and uh, uh, is feeding all these bad cycles of the patients, which is really uh, limiting their quality of life. So it's not only depression or changes in personality. Maybe changes in personality are caused by uh, the traumatic brain injury itself, but also by olfaction or olfactory. So what instructions we give about their diet? They have to avoid monotony. This is really significant. Of course, I can understand that for them, everything may be in the beginning, it's the same. So I had many patients saying that, okay, doctor, why to try to eat different things? All are the same for me. So that's why I decided to eat uh, only spaghetti, for example. But of course, this has uh, really uh, is causing significant problems 
in, the, in their health uh, in the short and the long term. So uh, fortunately now, many people with anosmia, they can find many recipes on the internet. There are some anosmic uh, cook uh, sites and you can find uh, really useful things in there. But I would say in general that in, uh, in a try to avoid monotony, we have to use different textures, different colors, just to, uh, uh, to prepare a food which is really interesting to us. We have to use spices because the other nerve, which is uh, not uh, damaged, is the trigeminal nerve in the nose, but is giving a kind of olfaction. So we have to use all these things in order to prepare a food which is uh, more uh, interesting for us and um, to avoid the monotony in our diet. So I will close this presentation giving you two examples and going back of what we said in the beginning. So patients are not uh, percentages, are not statistics. So this lady uh, came to me after uh, she was actually a gunshot uh, victim. It was a love affair. So her boyfriend uh, stood her and uh, she had to stay in ICU for long, uh, for many days. She had the neurosurgical uh, um, operation. Maybe you can see the screen here. So the whole chamber front a lot of damage. So two and a half years later, she came to our clinic. She survived, of course, but she was anonymous. But after the factory training, she became hypogenic and she's really happy about it because she can enjoy some food. She, uh, she actually overcome her uh, social anxiety. And um, I'm really happy to see her in, in, uh, in the regular appointments in our Melon based clinic. More impressive is, is the last case. This guy had a traffic accident. He stayed in ICU uh, for a month. So this uh, was eight years later. Came to me with an argument. So I really I had no, um, uh, I was not optimistic about him. But I said, why not? Why not to try with olfactory training? And uh, now I can say that it, it's in the limit between hyposmia and normosmia. Um, He's a really funny guy. I'm, I'm really happy with it. And it shows that although the clinical findings, the imaging findings, findings show it that there is no chance for him, he's, he's really happy about uh, his results. He enjoys uh, the food and he is coming to, to give some extra psychological aid to, to the other people, to the other patients in, in my clinic. That's a fantastic story. Yeah, this, is, this was my presentation and I'm uh, really happy to, to discuss uh, with you um, about uh, this case. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, now, I, I would like to say that if you've got a question for Jordan or for Kim, please use the Q&A button and I'll be looking at that um, while we're chatting. Um, Jordan, can you please un uh, stop sharing your screen? So we can go back to the three of us. You, there's a red button at the top of your Zoom screen. Uh, here, hang on. Let me let me help you do that. Stop sharing. Right there we go. Okay. So, um, right, Kim, I think maybe what I'd like to do is ask you now, uh, as you, you saw yourself in that opening uh, clip that was a very powerful clip, and you've heard Jordan speak, tell us a little bit about your smell loss and where you are now and how you've felt about that over the years. Thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, Jordan, for for. for um, sharing so much with us from a medical angle. Um, well, big question, Chrissy, because it's now um, just over nine and a half years since I had my traumatic brain injury. And um, 
yeah, I live with complete smell loss. I have no smell or ability to experience flavor whatsoever. So it's been a journey for me. And um, I guess it's, it's very important to open your mind to all the information that's out there um, to, to basically get a grip on what, what I'm living with. Does, does that make sense, Chrissy? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, in terms of, sorry. Excuse me, Kim, can I just clarify, um, do you have sense of true taste? Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Yes. You do. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And my tri trigeminal nerve works too. Yep. But when you say that to a non-nosmic, they can think, ah, so you can taste. Yes. And that's a tricky one because, yes, taste is technically your tongue doing, as you say, the salt, sour, sweetie, bitter, and umami. But in terms of the nuances of flavors that comes from smell and uh is it retro nasal action mm. yeah so when you chew your food the, the the flavors come up through the back of your mouth up into your nasal cavity mm. Mm. yeah and how do you feel i mean what what have been your strategies for adapting to to this new life that you have like Jordan said, I think when people um, first experience smell loss, especially if it's because of a traumatic brain injury, there's so much going on. There's so much else to you're concentrating on uh, recovering from the injury, especially if there's other uh, other things involved with the injury. That's that your sense of smell is almost put in the background and I think like for me I think it's I try to just live life without uh, facing it for about three to four years um, and then it became apparent that I did need to uh, acknowledge the fact that I couldn't smell and the impact impact it was having on me and to open my mind and to basically own up to it because it's a very very personal loss mm. and um i think currently it it's easier because of covid19 because anosmia is way more recognized but uh if you rewind back to when my accident happened and the, the, the three to four years afterwards, nobody, nobody knew what, or very few people knew what anosmia, the word anosmia was. And if you Googled it, it didn't come up. Whereas COVID has brought that to, um, to everybody's attention more so. And also I think in trying to find out more about my sensory loss, it does open corridors and you meet lots of wonderful people like yourself, Chrissy, who's champions smell training, which I totally get. I totally understand it. I have to put my hand up and say, I don't necessarily, well, I don't think it's going to work for me because obviously nine and a half years plus in, and also because of the severity of my brain injury. And I can go into that and Jordan would totally understand what I'm going to say if I did, but I don't think it's necessarily going to work for me, but I do get the concept and I do, if, if there's a hint, if you have a hint of any smell, whether it be hyposmia or parosmia, whatever, Absolutely. you've got nothing to lose nothing to lose give it a go mm. I, I mean when people say to me you know is it worth me trying to smell train I always say if you can put two things in front of you you know put a blindfold on uh, and they should be two really different things you know maybe it's a coffee and a lemon or a sprig of rosemary and some peanut butter whatever it is 
if you if blindfolded you can perceive a difference between them it doesn't have to be it, it can be the weakest imaginable mm -hmm. signal with no real meaning to it but mm -hmm. as long as you recognize a difference between one thing and another thing then you should then you should give it a go because yes it's, definitely uh, just enough definitely. To signal. Mm. and also sorry it's it's a bit like um fitness it, i think you've said before chrissy it's like um physiotherapy for the nose and it's like if i chose to go down to the fitness class and uh, because i want to build some muscles and i might turn up for the first class and be quite despondent because one i'm out of my comfort zone and two after I realized that I'm not very good at my fitness and three, I came out of the class and I haven't got the muscles. Whereas if you pursue it and keep at it and keep at it, if it's going to work, if it's going to work, it, yeah, you've got to give it, you've got to give it um, commitment. Yeah. Be open-minded. Um, uh, I, I think it was you that I heard in a lecture once talking with this is this is about the severity of the injury and the likelihood of total loss of smell and in, in other words the likelihood of a complete um, severing of the olfactory nerve and I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was you that told me about um, a, an experiment that they did on the olfactory nerve to sort of work out how much tension you'd have to put on it before oh, yeah it tore and it was sort of three grams or something. Am, am I remembering that right? Yeah, that's true. It was an experimental study showing that just a few ml of water needs to, to share the olfactory filament of the uh, skull base. So of course it was experimental. It was a cadaveric study. It's not the real life because if you ask the nearest agents, they will say that oh, no, it's not really easy to detach the olfactory nerve from the skull base, but I think the truth is in between. So now, that's why uh, with a small contusion, you, you can uh, have a smell loss. Otherwise, if it was difficult to injury the olfactory filament, we won't have smell losses in, in, in mild injury. Right. I don't know the exact mechanism, but maybe there is a shearing of the olfactory filament, but I would say also, Maybe you have an ischemia uh, in no uh, blood supply because of all this edema in this area. And um, uh, we need more studies to, to, to say something about this. I would right. say uh, of uh, what Kim said before, that it, it's a good way to see olfactory training as a physiotherapy of the nose, but especially for people with uh, a traumatic brain injury, they have to expect that it's a long journey. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to uh, say about olfactory training in post-infectious patients because after a couple of months, they see some improvement. So it's, it's a good a boost to, uh, it's a good for them to uh, have to continue this uh, long uh, training scheme because uh, especially in Greece, it's difficult to convince people to follow something for four months, for six months, waiting for some improvement. So I'm trying to give them appointments after one and two months, saying, okay, it's not something which is coming back really quickly. You have to, to wait and be patient with this. Uh, and yes, after four to six months, I would say we can see some improvement. Uh, this is the main difference between the post-traumatic patients and the other category, mm -hmm. like the post-infectious disorders. So, um, they need to be uh, really uh, focused on this. And it's really hard to, to convince them. So they need our support to this. Uh, that's why I talk about multidisciplinary approach. Okay, um, now we've got, we've got some questions. We got two questions from the same anonymous attendee. So I'm gonna start with the second one because I have a question about your first question, anonymous. Um, uh, so we're going to start with Kim. Uh, the question for you is, given that so many people are currently struggling with COVID-related anosmia, what would be your top tips for coping and compensating for this? Wow. Good question. Fantastic question. Woo. Um, okay. For me, uh, 
connecting with nature. Nature is beautiful. Um, the garden, the park, walks in the forest, um, just appreciating the beauty, the, ch the changing color of the trees. That's one thing. Um, bird song, yeah, nature. And then going on from that, I guess it's really important to um, sort of not let it get you down and to, to do, to, to get out there, to get walking if you can. Uh, cardiovascular exercise is so important to get those endorphins going. Um, music is a good one. Uh, bring in flowers into the kitchen so that <laughs> when you're washing up, you can look at the flowers and it makes you smile. And when you're cooking and you're feeling a bit down because you can't smell the onion or this or that, you get the music on and let that drown out the sorrow. It's, it's interesting what you said about getting out into nature with the autumn colors because I found that I craved bright colors. Yeah. You know that that yeah that just beautiful um, beautiful colors in in and you know as you say in flowers or in textiles or in what I was mm -hmm. wearing or j mm -hmm. wherever I cast my eye or going to a museum yes uh, I found that a, a very very beneficial yes yeah good question very good question yeah you go ahead give you uh, information that uh, you never thought about it. I remember a lady who came with improvement in uh, her refraction saying that uh, I'm happy because I can smell my baby. Yeah. So it was, it was really emotional for her. Yeah. I could yeah. understand that before, but uh, now I can understand how this connection of people is mm -hmm. coming through also the smell. Yeah. So how important is to, to create uh, uh, all this system, which is chemical mm. and emotional together. Mm. Mm. It is huge because, um, Julie, you probably know what I'm touching on now, but the, the sense of smell is so directly connected to the amygdala and the hippocampus, where the uh, emotion, basically it's the emotion center and the memory center if I'm correct and so as when the question that the uh, that was asked it's so important to try and get that balance because when you have no smell loss that it, you're always trying to balance the deficit mm -hmm. of, of the fact that you've lost one of your precious senses that we you know when when we were in the womb we could smell and, and um, taste the flavor, I'm sure, as we were growing in the womb. So to then have it stripped away, there's going to be an imbalance. Would you agree with that? Sorry, are you asking? What's Sorry, that? I was just asking Jordan whether, whether that makes some kind of sense. Totally agree with you. Uh, there is no doubt that other memories are connected with emotions. We have these other memories. It's, it is really significant to uh, try through olfactory training, all these things that we mentioned before, to reestablish these uh, uh, emotional connections. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a way to come back to our life, to our mm -hmm. life before. If it is not uh, possible, of course, there are some strategies to compensate, but if, if we live with it, it's not the end of the world if we lose our olfaction, okay? Uh, in, in many courses, Chris uh, uh, maybe remembers that we say that, okay, if we ask 10 people, uh, which sense do you like to, to lose? If you had to lose one, nobody will say vision. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them will say olfaction. Mm -hmm. They would. But, uh, as we say in my country, you, you don't know the value of something if you don't lose it. Yeah. So maybe the pandemic was an opportunity, of course, despite all these negative things, to 
to for people involved in olfaction to, to see uh, for how important it is in, in uh, for many people because now uh, a significant percentage of people of uh, infected people have some kind of uh, uh, olfactory loss and that's why we have to take this opportunity to pass all the information uh, uh, we need about uh, uh, olfactory loss and post infectious uh, disorders, and traumatic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not the problem only of the patient. I think it's a problem also of the medical world. Yes. For example, how many general practitioners know how to deal with these patients? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a uh, it's one of the causes of a late consultation in special mental health centers. Mm -hmm. How many uh, medical doctors in ICUs, et cetera, et cetera, they know uh, about the causes of olfactory loss. So uh, in the near future, we have to uh, make some kind of guidelines for them. Of course, for specialists, it looks normal, but uh, the problem is how all these people can reach the specialists. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to uh, review a paper from the UK uh, recently, and I was amazed because 50% of people said that uh, I had the medical consultation and a consultation from a GP and then nothing. I mean, no treatment, no other option. Mm -hmm. it, it's not only in the UK, I, I presume. It's, it's uh, most, uh, more or like... Uh, Thank you, Jordan. The dots need joining up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to take some more questions now. Um, Leo Holzel has said, hello, Kim. Uh, you said you tried to live your life without facing your loss, but it became apparent to you that you needed to approach it. What brought you to that turning point? And can you describe your approach? I think we may have covered some of those, but what, what was your big wow moment when you thought, I've, I've got to get a different mindset on this? Two things. I th it was quite serious and I had no idea because I buried the loss. It's an invisible loss and I felt embarrassed to, you know, I had the wonderful, amazing, as you saw on the video clip, amazing support of a critical care doctor coming to my home and um, intubating me and anaesthetizing me in order to prevent any long-term damage. So I had the incredible help of the NHS and also in ICU and um, uh, all the hospital care that I had. So I felt embarrassed to, it felt like I was complaining that I couldn't smell. That was my own personal view on it. And um, one day I was just walking in the forest and I just just felt I couldn't put another step forward. I was mentally exhausted, mentally exhausted. And I felt I couldn't burden my family with it anymore. And um, I spoke to a friend and she suggested that I speak to my GP, which then Fortunately, my GP listened and she referred me back to the hospital, um, Southampton General Health Hospital that had dealt with my trauma. And I was fortunate enough to speak with the head injury nurse there who had a tremendous amount of empathy as a healthcare professional. And that was quite a, a, a moment in as much as after sort of speaking about it and um, having some precious time to, to just unload three and a half years of stored up emotional sadness. Um, she suggested that I treat the loss as a bereavement. And that's quite a biggie. And that was, that was the turning point for me to slowly accept my loss and go forward. I hope I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, that's yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have another question now from Kate. Um, she says I missed the beginning of the session, so apologies if this has already been answered. How and where is smell training available in the UK? Well, Kate, you have come to the right place. <laughs> uh, uh, Kate, if you go onto the absent.org website. Um, we've got uh, two places that you can find out about smell training there. 
either just go to absent.org forward slash smell training, where you'll have the information in print with some links. So there are links to um, an information sheet, how you can make your own smell training kit and why it's important to make it that way. I think that I've devised the best way that there is. Um, I wouldn't be offering you the second best way. Um, and I, I do think there are very good reasons for designing it the way I have. So you can read about those in that little brochure. Um, then there is another brochure that will help you, which, which has a little diary in it. There's an explanation so you can keep track of your smell training. Um, you'll be doing this long term if you have a head injury. So do be prepared um, to be keeping a diary for a little bit longer. Um, if you'd rather get your information about smell training from a video, when you go onto the absent.org website, um, there is, we have a new section that we've uh, built with the British Rhinological Society called Nosewell that was made in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but the section on smell training is every bit as applicable to you as it is to anyone who's had COVID-19. So you can find out about that there. We have lots of uh, other webinars um, on our YouTube channel, which you can just find at YouTube by Googling, uh, by searching uh, on YouTube for absent anosmia support. Um, this is, as I said in the beginning of, of, this, uh, of the hour, this is our 12th um, webinar on a range of topics that I think have broad interest to everyone, whether you're a head injury patient or um, a post, post viral loss patient. So I hope that answers your question. And if you're not, um, if you haven't joined us on Facebook yet, do join that conversation because um, we've got um, at the moment 9,000 people um, in the COVID-19 Facebook group and over, I think soon to be 6,000 in the absent original group. Um, and we discuss smell training all the time. So do, do come along there and uh, ask questions or listen in. Right, so the next question we have here is, let me just, uh, is from Michelle and she says, I lost my sense of smell six months ago. I'm not sure if COVID or another viral infection. So welcome to the TBI uh, hour, of uh, Michelle. Um, uh, she says she's had an MRI and a neurologist said it all looked fine and my sense of smell should come back before smell training. Is there anything else I should rule out first? Well, Jordan, you're the doctor here. I, I realize this is not a TBI question, but would you would you like to say what you would do if if someone came in and just had um, smell loss as Michelle has had? So yes, uh, although the post infectious is not our topic, I would say that olfactory training is the main thing, and uh, we have better percentages of improvement uh, in this category of uh, people. Uh, after olfactory training, usually 60 to 65 percent of uh, patients have some improvement, which is really important. Another two things that I could uh, try is uh, an oral steroid course, but with the limitations that we have in, in COVID-19 patients. Uh, in my opinion, steroids in the most of, of these people do not work, but we don't know whom of them? I mean, who is a suitable pa a patient for, for steroids? Um, it's not a patient who is coming quite late. So let's say that we have a history of one year after, post uh, uh, after an infection. So I wouldn't try with steroids. But if some, somebody is coming uh, quite early, within the first two to three months, yes, I would try a short course. Uh, the other thing is, is there is a concomitant uh, disorder. So if it is combined sinusitis, if our uh, um, clinical evaluation shows that there is an inflammatory uh, condition in the nose, yes, I will try with steroids also. And the third thing is uh, uh, intranasal vitamin A. It seems that it works especially in post-infectious uh, cases in combination with uh, olfactory training. So if we combine olfactory training with uh, vitamin A drops in the nose, then uh, things go better. Unfortunately, we have a great difficulty getting the vitamin A nose drops. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, they, are, they are manufactured in Germany and Austria and they're, they're not easy to get hold of. To be honest, uh, most of uh, the people here in Greece 
uh, they uh, um, uh, try to, to get these drops uh, via internet. Yeah. From Germany, mainly from Germany. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we, our time is up tonight. Um, and as usual, the hour has flown by. So um, I would just like to say thank you very much, Jordan, for being my guest tonight. It and was a Kim, pleasure for me. I'm so glad. And, and Kim, thank you for sharing a, a, a very powerful and very moving story. Also very harrowing for anyone who has themselves had a head injury to watch that. So I know that was a brave thing to do. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, Chrissy, may, sorry, may I just interject for very quickly? May I? Smell training. It's, I don't think it's going to work for me, but what I would say is when you do smell train, is have the visionary thing as well. Absolutely. Because I think, like, and like Jordan said, it also comes from above as well. So if you can build the picture, and, and not get despondent and use visual aid as well, it, it could help. Yes, there you good. go. Good. Thank oh, you. <laughs> so, um, and in two weeks, everyone, I will be um, on with Deka Burgess Watson, and I think we're going to have one other guest. We're going to be talking about coping strategies for people who have had uh, this terrible parosmia, which is coming along with a lot of COVID-19 cases. Um, we're going to be talking about that and how people can hopefully improve their, um, their experience of food. So that will be very exciting in two weeks. Um, this will be taped and put up uh, into the, into, onto our um, library of, of webinars on YouTube. So you can also watch it again if you wish. So thank you very much, everyone. Good night and see you another time. <laughs>